Okay, so we're going to talk about the process of inflammation now. And um, this will kind of bring together some of the information about how the immune system works. So obviously, this here is a, um, is a finger. And it has an intact um, barrier defense of skin. But right now, we are going to change that. And this poor guy um, got a break in his skin. And, you know, maybe he cut himself um, or whatnot, but now he's got a break in his skin and he's bleeding a little bit. Now, two things could happen here. One is, you know, maybe he broke his skin on a clean surface, um, or, you know, maybe he injured his skin on a dirty surface. If he cleaned his skin, if he damaged his skin on a clean surface, you know, underneath the layers of, of keratinized, um, epithelial cells, and dead cells in the skin there are living cells and if he injured if he injures the cells right these cells here get destroyed then these cells are going to release lice their contents and start to do damage to other cells so these cells have you know lots of proteins in them um, that will spill out into the surrounding tissue and, of course, inside all of our tissues, including our skin, we have tissue macrophages. And we have mast cells that are granulated cells that are filled with these little um, lysosomes f filled with um, the vesicles with uh, histamine and other chemicals in them. So um, inflammation can be stimulated by either m by mast cells or um, or phagocytic cells, tissue macrophages recognizing a protein from damaged cells or by recognizing proteins from bacteria that manage to make their way into the tissues. So these bacteria, you know, have little proteins, are studded with proteins, and those proteins will bind with the cells. Okay? Now, they bind with them even though they're still attached here. Okay. Now the name for these proteins that are binding with the mast cells or the macrophages are called um, pathogen associated molecular patterns or pa P or PAMPs. Okay. So pathogen associated molecular patterns. And these are um, molecules that are recognized by mast cells or macrophages that can start the process or stimulate an immune response. So these are going to be engulfed by the phagocytes or bind with the membranes of mast cells um, and be recognized. And this is one way that um, that the innate, uh, the innate immune system can begin. Now, you know, it's interesting. If you read the Goiten book, it talks about, um, you know, different steps or different, um, you know, different steps in our immune process. And it's really hard to say that it, it all occurs in a stepwise fashion, that macrophages are stimulated first and then, um, and then mast cells and then complement. Um, really, you know, these, um, these pattern, uh, these pathogen associated molecular um, proteins or patterns, um, they, uh, they actually can directly um, initiate um, either mast cells and um, some of them can even start the uh, complement cascade um, in and of itself. So these, um, these steps in the process are not necessarily strictly followed and again these are all sort of interrelated. Um, so just sort of keep that in your mind as we go through this. In any case, um, what's going to happen is mast cells um, or and or macrophages are going to begin releasing um, chemokines 
and start the inflammatory process. So, you know, we'll have histamine released and some other chemokines um, like uh, tumor necrosis factor and some of the interleukins. Um, and again, you don't need to know all of these um, to do well in the test, but it's going to have um, a few significant effects. Um, first, you know, we have arterioles supplying the tissue and it's going to cause arterial dilation in this area. So this is going to um, this is going to cause you know the skin to start to look reddened in this area or cause rubor. Okay, and then um, you know this serves several purposes. It, this increases the blood flow to the area so that we can increase the delivery of all the complement proteins and inflammatory proteins that we need to have there. Um, it also increases the size of the vessel so that um, white blood cells can make it to the area. So we have some neutrophils here. And you know the next thing that happens is along the walls of these vessels um, the neutrophils um, are sort of um, are being attracted to the chemicals of inflammation and they begin to sort of bind with the epithelial, endothelial cells and sort of instead of just um, floating through the blood they begin to sort of roll along the side of these vessels because of their interaction with the inflammatory chemicals and then um, through the process of opsonization where they're getting attracted to the area um, they're going to move through the uh, endothelial cells. Now that brings me to the second stage of the process here. Um, the endothelial cells here are usually relatively tightly um, connected together but because of the process of inflammation the endothelial cells are sort of split apart a little bit and increase the size of their interstices. Now again this allows the process of uh, white blood cells squeezing out of the arterioles and capillaries actually only the capillaries um, out of the blood vessels um, and it also allows the delivery of proteins to those tissues. Now just to remind you of the back, um, the some of the vocabulary here as you know the neutrophils sort of roll along this vessel and then make their way into the tissue it sort of squeezes through the um, tissue in a process called diapedesis so that's just the the diapedesis is the neutrophils ability to sort of change shape and squeeze in between the widened interstices of the endothelial cells all right so number two here is endothelial cell retraction. Which leads to capillary leak. Because the capillaries, you know, the capillaries are usually impermeable to proteins. Um, so they only allow water and electrolytes to pass through. But when there is inflammation, the capillaries begin to leak, and what they're leaking is proteins. And of course, this allows um, the complement proteins and um, clotting proteins and the kinin calicrin pro proteins to um, to get into the tissue. And also, because the proteins are leaking into the tissues, um, actually more liquid than usual um, will follow it, um, and so that is going to cause erythema or swelling of that area. Um, and this, you know, this is that rubor, um, tumor, and calor. And, you know, the calor is also related to, um, to the increased blood flow to the area as well. Now, the next step in the process is we're going to have the um, activation of the complement through um, uh, through activity through cytokines that are secreted by mast cells and macrophages and um, we you remember what the complement does um, it can it's going to further increase the um, the 
chemotaxis of neutrophils. It's going to increase the number of neutrophils. It's going to, um, if there are bacteria present, it's going to um, opsonize the bacteria. And it will also cause cell lysis of bacteria as well. Now one of the other things that complement does, remember how I talked about the three um, protein cascades in the blood, the, the complement system, the, um, the kind and calocrine system, and the clotting systems are all sort of connected together. Well complement can, um, can directly begin the process of the clotting cascade to occur. So one of the things that is happening here is complement is starting the clotting cascade. And it does this by um, activating tissue factor. Now, so one of the things that happens is the clotting cascade is, is, um, is initiated and this sort of walls off the whole area, begins the process of walling off the area of inflammation. So, you know, eventually we're going to have fibrin um, infiltrate all of the tissues and wall off this whole area. And you can see that this is a very protective mechanism because it's going to, if there is significant infection here and the body is losing the battle, this prevents, this prevents bacteria from spreading out of the tissue because the fibrin, the fib fibrin makes this thick wall here. Okay, um, and you are aware of this, anyone who um, you know has seen patients with an abscess, this is exactly what happens. Um, there's a significant inflammatory uh, response, a local tissue inflammatory response, and the body um, walls it over, walls it off, and then we get a buildup of pus on the inside. And what is pus? It's a, um, it's a collection of protein-rich fluid that's filled with dead macrophages and neutrophils and mast cells and bacteria. Now, you know, so this is pus formation within a walled off category, uh, within a wall, walled off area. So pus is, um, pus can be, now remember, this whole process can occur in a sterile wound. So even if this wound were sterile and there were no bacteria in here, um, the process can occur um, through just because of cell injury, which can um, which have um, pathogen-associated molecular patterns that can begin the um, inflammatory response just as well as the proteins that are on bacteria themselves. Just these just come from injured cells. So you can have sterile pus and this occurs quite often so really it's just the same collection of protein rich fluid with dead white blood cells without the bacteria. Now the other thing that um, the other cascade that sort of gets um, that gets um, initiated by this whole process it's not directly through the complement cascade but it is through other um, chemical from chemokines that are um, that are released into the tissue and these chemokines like tumor necrosis factor and interleukin-3 I believe these initiate the kin and calocrine system which um, you know one of the pathways ends in the release of bradykinin and there's some other similar chemicals and bradykinin gets released into the area and it initiates a pain response so we end up with pain. Okay, so that gives us, so we have rubor, two more, calor is heat, and then the fourth manifestation is pain. And you can kind of see how these are all caused by these interrelated processes that are occurring. Now, I want to talk a little bit now about how this, you know, locally, this process is very effective because you end up, you know, controlling a potential infection very, very well. Because, you know, the process that causes, the processes that cause arteriolar dilation allow neutrophils to get to the area. The, um, 
endothelial cell um, changes that um, increase the interstices allow proteins and neutrophils and other cells to migrate to the area to fight the effect um, the infection or possible infection very effectively and the clotting cascade the activity of the clotting cascade to wall off this area is very protective as well but when these same processes occur on a systemic basis we end up with a problem and what we what we end up with is a systemic inflammatory response now if you imagine if we have a really severe infection in our bloodstream or we have a real serious injury in a large proportion of our tissues so we could have a you know bacteremia or we could have you know injury to an entire organ like mesenteric ischemia you know or where we have injury to you know a huge portion of the cells in our gut or you know we could have acute lung injury any of these things if we injure enough cells we can cause an inflammatory response that is systemic that involves the entire body now imagine if you dilate every arteriole in your entire body so remember the the different things that happen we have arteriolar dilation And what happens if that, that occurs throughout the, the entire body? You're going to decrease blood pressure significantly. Um, and then the other thing that happens is we have throughout our body, all of our capillaries are leaking proteins and extra fluid, right? So we end up with capillary leak. What's this going to cause? Well, it's going to cause edema for one thing, and it can cause pulmonary edema, which can make you short of breath. And it also, we're, since we're losing so much fluid, we're decreasing blood blood pressure even more. And then the third thing, the third major problem that occurs is we have activation of the clotting cascade throughout the entire body. And this is really problematic because we end up clotting all over the place. And usually clotting, so clotting is actually a, works through a positive feedback mechanism. And it's regulated by various things, and we're going to talk about this um, in, in more detail when we um, when we talk about the uh, hematologic system. But suffice it to say that clotting is, is controlled by other regulatory factors. And when we have cl massive clotting throughout our body, we end up overwhelming our, um, our regulatory mechanisms. So we have sort of uncontrolled clotting throughout our body. And we end up with, um, we end up with microemboli. Actually, here I should write it like this be consistent um, so clotting we end up with microemboli sometimes macroemboli you could get a DVT um, and this all of these the low blood pressure and poor perfusion and the microemboli decreases perfusion for further and you end up with ischemia and necrosis and of course what does ischemia and necrosis do well of course it's cell injury so it is going to increase the inflammation and it's going to end up being a positive feedback loop and make all of these things worse and then you're going to get into a vicious cycle which is otherwise known as a downward spiral until death if it's not stopped Okay, so that is um, systemic inflammatory response syndrome in a nutshell.
and it's um, that really gives you an idea of why it is um, such a dangerous situation.